Hi, and welcome to this section on Build and Deploy Automation. In the previous section, we talked about how to provision Azure resources using PowerShell. We will also be revisiting Azure in this section. In this section, we will talk about how to write good automation scripts in general, before we dig into building .NET applications from PowerShell. And finally, we will see how we can set up and customize automated build and deployment to an Azure web application. Now we move on to the first video of this section that deals with writing good automation scripts. In this video, we will discuss what makes up a good automation script in general. Now, in my opinion, there are five characteristics or traits that is useful when writing automation scripts. For this video, we have gathered five traits that we will discuss. They are idempotent, extrovert, auditable, being a good citizen, and reusable. The first characteristic of a good automation script is that it is idempotent. So what does that mean? There are more formal definitions around, but for our purposes, it means that running a task any number of times should give the same result as running it once. In other words, the task should not fail or change the outcome if it has been run before. One way to code this is to test the state before executing a task that has any side effects in the system. You might call them guard clauses. Let's have an example. So, let's create an example for idempotency. Let's create a sample file called tasks.ps1. So, to make the point, let's make a very simple case. Let's say we want a script that performs three tasks. Create a directory, make sure the directory is empty, and then write a single file to that directory. So let's start by creating the directory. Oh, that was simple. For the first time, that went well. But let's run it again. There is an error. So how can we fix this? In the case of creating a directory, the simplest way is to use the for switch. Use the force loop. However, to generalize this approach a bit, I would rather test for the existence of the directory first. Let's clear the screen. So, if not test path foo path, we can give it a path type container, which is basically a folder. Then, if it doesn't exist, then go ahead and create it. So, now I can run this as many times as I want, and it doesn't fail. So, let's copy the previous command to the clipboard. And take it with us to our file and paste it here. So that's it for the first step. Now the next step is to empty the directory. So let's do that. Delete foo backslash star. That was simple. Let's test it if there is something in the directory. Just create a simple file in the directory. Text something something pipe it to foo bar.txt for instance and just test our command and we're still good so I'll just just copy that to the clipboard there we go so and we're ready for our final step write to a file in the directory let's go back and do that for instance uh, let's get the current time get date Pipe that to a file foo slash bar.txt like that and take that with us. Okay, so then we have our script ready. So let's try and run it. Tasks, and that's good. It still runs. And can run as many times as I want, which basically means that. Our step is now idempotent, and we have finished the first trait that we talked about. So let's go back to the next trait. Now, the second trait is extrovert. 
Extrovert is a term from psychology, and calling a computer script extrovert might be a misuse of the term. But basically what I mean here is that the script should report what it is doing. Now, PowerShell has several redirection streams that is useful for this purpose. We can use the different write commandlets to give information about the script executing, denoting the purpose of each message. Also, I would recommend avoiding using the write host commandlet, which explicitly send the output to the console host and prevent it from being handled properly. But again, let's have a look at a, a simple example. So, how should we make this script more extrovert? We'll start with the directory creation step. Let's write an informational message when the directory is created. And by the way, let's pipe the, st the standard output um, to null to avoid the clutter. But also, let's write a message in the case the directory already exists. And as for the step to delete the files, let's also be explicit about it and also introduce a test for it. Also, write information in the case that the directory is empty. Now let's run the script. Let's delete the folder first and try the script again. But what are we missing? Actually, what we are missing is that the information preferences global variable is set not to display the information. So we need to set it information preference equals continue instead of silently continue. Let's clear the screen. And again, here we have, now we have the information that the script is reporting. So again, let's try and delete the directory first, and then run the tasks. And this time it creates the directory and then of course it is actually empty and so that's what we expected. So the next trait is auditable. By this I mean that it should be easy to trace or audit what the script execution did. So the recommendation here is to log the script activity to disk and by some means make it as easy available as possible for review. Now there is an easy way to have the script output logged, and that's via the start transcript commandlet. So basically, we just tell the commandlet which file to log to, and off it goes. Now I can run the tasks, and I can perform any operations, and when I'm done, I tell it to stop the transcript, and then we can have a look at the file. Now at the top here, we see that it logged information about the execution, like the start time, the computer name, the username and the script run under, PowerShell version, etc. The fourth trait is being a good citizen. But what does that mean for a script. I recommend this. The script should return non-zero exit codes in case of an error. As much as possible, the script should leave the system in a well-defined state. A practical way to implement this is to check or validate the script's preconditions 
as much as possible before start changing the state of the system. Now, there is much to being a good citizen. One of the aspects is returning a non-zero error code in case of an error. Let's create a rather silly script example. Now this script does only one thing. It fails with exit code 1 if we ask it to, otherwise it does nothing. Actually, let's make it explicit that otherwise it would exit with 0. So, let's go back to the command line and try the script. So, can fail. Now what I can do here is that I can use a special variable dollar question mark which actually tells me whether the last execution was successful or not. So in this case it returns true. Also I can use the global variable last exit code to find the exit code of the last execution. In this case it was zero indicating a script success or execution success. Now again let's run our script, but this time let's make it fail. Do fail. And in this time it was not successful and the last exit code is now 1, indicating an error. Then let's write another script that actually calls our can fail script. So first I write the code for calling our script can fail.ps1. Check afterwards uh, for success. Now, here we test the variable. If it's not true, then I write an error and then I pick up the error from the global error variable. And this is basically an array of the last error code error messages in the current PowerShell runtime. So here I just pick the last one and then I write that to the error stream and then this script will exit or where it propagates the last exit code from can fail. So also let's just add a, a line here indicating whether or not it was it actually run successfully. Right output run can fail PS1 successfully, like that. Now let's try and run our new script. So it didn't fail, obviously, but let's go and make it fail. And here we go. Actually, it picked up on an old error message from uh, an earlier script, and then it stopped. And I can see the last exit code is here 1 because it was propagated. So the idea here is that your script should propagate error codes and properly report on errors. But there is one alternative way to achieve this. Let's go back to the task 2 script. And at the top here, we'll use the global variable error action preference where we set it to stop immediately in case of an error and this time actually i won't need to explicitly exit the execution here because it does does, uh, does that automatically so setting the error action preference to stop is to my experience a good thing because it helps us having the system in a pre in a well defined state like I like I talked about earlier in case of an error it should stop immediately but because if the script continues running in case of an error who knows what might happen it might reach an, an illegal state so it's better to stop immediately in case of an error and also if you put your preconditions validations on top of your script it will stop before it starts to create side effects on your system so that would be a good idea to to my mind so the final trait is reusable this is probably the most difficult trait to define there is so much 
to it to being a reusable. Now here's a few suggestions. Organize your code into functions, scripts, script files and modules. We will investigate this more later in this course. Do not rely on relative paths or current directory when passing file information to other modules, other scripts and other commandlets. Also use push d or pop d uh, when traversing the file system in a script. It makes this easier to backtrack. Make sure the return values from the script are semantically sound. Avoid using write host and also create non-interactive scripts which for instance means that you should use the non-interactive switch if you execute PowerShell. Do not use the read host and set the progress preference global variable to silently continue.